Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I want to talk to you about moving house. I want to talk to you in the context of being freed from the house of fear. I may be preaching this message 50% at least to myself tonight, and I will follow this message up when I get back from Australia, because hearing that Univision is on next week, I wanted to get as far away as I could, so I'm going to Australia. <laughs> so, next Saturday night, I'll be watching Aussie Rules football as opposed to Eurovision. Um, but I will follow this message up with, with at least one message, maybe two, about faith. So I have purpose in what I want to bring to you on our journey, and this is also following on from what we said last week about you can't put new wines, or you've got to be foolish to try and put new wine in an old wineskin. So we're talking about moving house, being freed from the house of fear, okay? And um, uh, the, the, the verse that goes with this says these words. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, I don't know if we, for God, you did not, I mean, I'm quoting it how I learned it, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. So, so the issue is, if God does not give us a spirit of fear, the question is, where did it come from, and where does it come from, because it's very powerful, and how come fear is so powerful in so many ways, in so many lives, at so many times? We become afraid of life, death, not having enough, sickness, rejection, abandonment, not being loved, being alone, taken advantage of, not being wanted, abused, truth, confrontation, conflict, people being judged, condemnation, disrespect, not being understood, lack of control, being controlled, that I will not appear good, making a decision, not making a decision, <laughs> self, others, things, and we can become totally bound by the what ifs and the shoulds. Living every day in the house of fear and keeping up the mortgage payment because we're afraid of what will happen if we default. Responding to every demand fearfully because we fear the result if we don't. Afraid to not be afraid in case that will produce an even worse scenario than the one I fear. And that makes me afraid. One thing is clear. That fear is not in your head. Fear is in your spirit. Fear is in your heart. That's why the Bible connects fear with spirit. Therefore, it must be gotten out of your spirit, not out of your head. So, what is fear? Anybody know what the Greek word for fear is? You'll know it when I tell you. It's the word phobos, from which we get the word what? Phobia. What is a phobia? A phobia is the fear of. The word fear is a phobia. That's what it is. So what is fear? Here's several things that fear is. Fear is not a material substance. It's not something that someone comes and dumps on your lap or drops into your life or that you could take a bucket or a spade and say, here, I've gathered together some fear, take a look at it. It is not a material substance, therefore cannot be dealt with materially. It does not attack, it does not and cannot exist independently. There is no such thing as unattached fear. Fear is always attached to something. Here's the next one. It is a power or a law or a force which has to be activated to have an impact. Fear is a power, a law or a force that requires activation. For example, for an aeroplane to experience the law of lift, 
He'd have to open its thrusters and go down the runway at excessive speed until the law of lift overcomes the law of gravity. If it doesn't put into action the law of lift, it will not overcome the law of gravity. But you can't see the law of lift. I can't show you the law of left. I can only show you something that is living within the law of left. And I can show you people are living in fear. It's like, it's like, it's like um, you jump off a cliff and are you going to go up or down? You will be subject to a law, a power or a force which has been activated by your jumping that then comes in. Fear is just like that. It's a power or a law or a force which has to be activated to have an impact. And if it's not, it doesn't happen. Here's the next one. It only exists within the boundaries of its law. So like gravity only exists while ever you're in the boundaries of the law of gravity. So if we were to have the privilege, which would fill some of you with fear, to get in a rocket and to go outside of the Earth's atmosphere and away from what we call Earth's gravitational pull, you would realize that in space there is no gravity. If you go out, you float around. Your drink floats out of your cup. You have to catch it with your mouth because there is no gravity. So laws it only exist within the boundaries of that law. Fear is the same. It only exists while you live within the boundaries of the law of fear. So if you can get outside of that, you're in good shape. And that's why I call it the house of fear, living in the house of fear. Let me give you three other things. Number one, it becomes a force through what I believe. So you will not be afraid if your believing is right. It is impossible to fear when believing is right. So therefore, when I fear, believing is wrong. Because fear only becomes a force through what I believe. Right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3 verse 10, when Adam and Eve have done what they've done and God comes looking, these were his words, I was afraid, first mention of fear in the Bible, because I was naked, so I hid. Why did he fear being naked? He had always been naked. God had never known him any other way but naked. But now he believed something about his nakedness, about God, and about what was going to happen to him and Eve. So therefore, the fear that he had only became a force through what he believed. Your fear is only a force through what you believe. Number two. Fear is carried along on the conveyor belt of my confession. Let me explain. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, Paul wrote these words, I have believed, therefore have I spoken. Or in other words, I begin to speak what it is that I believe. So when my belief takes me into fear, I will not be able to resist speaking what it is that actually is making fear a force in my life. There are other scriptures. Romans 10 verse 9 says, if we confess with our mouth, it talks about what happens when we confess. Confession makes the unseen seen. It makes the perceived real. So as I begin to confess and speak in my life, and those words are governed by the fear that is driving me, that's become a force because of what I believe, the more I confess it, the more I bind myself into the house of fear. Confession can be internal, so you might have said, I've not said anything to anybody. You've said plenty to yourself, and you're saying plenty to yourself. Do you know, gossip's not just something that you do with someone else. Gossip's something that you can participate in yourself. What you say about what you think may not be out there, but it's out there in the terms of what God sees as he looks at the heart, condemnation, judgment, and all the things that we confess. So, that confession can be internal, it can be to yourself, it can be external to others, or it can be to situations. What we say about the situation, I will never be able to overcome this. That's confessing the conveyor belt of confession to a situation that is empowering the fear in your heart that you will never be free from the situation. The conveyor belt of confession is what carries the force of fear. Number three, 
Fear manifests itself in my reactions to the challenges of life. Again, Genesis 3 verse 10. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That was his, that was his, his manifestation, his reaction to the challenges of life. How we react to the challenges of life, if we do not get out of the household of fear, will always promote that fear to the fore, to the extent where we were saying, I'm afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So I tried to run away. So I believed things. So I avoided. And all that happens is that we become captive in the house of fear. These three areas I've just talked about, becoming a force through what I believe, it being carried along the conveyor belt of my confession, and fear manifesting itself in my reaction to the challenges of life are the three areas that are the battleground to fight to be free from fear. These are the three battleground areas, okay? Let me say them again. It becomes a force to what I believe, battleground area number one. It's carried along on the conveyor belt of my confessional, battleground area number two. It manifests itself in my reaction to the challenges of life, battleground three, okay? So let's talk about the nature of fear. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15 says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, this is Jesus, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery, listen for the word, by their fear of death. Okay? So, let me give you five more things. Number one, fear is attached to my humanity. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. So, Jesus took on our humanity because fear is attached to my humanity. If I live from the basis, listen to this, but we're all human... I give fear the right to be activated in my life, and I guarantee you it will be. So when your answer is, but we're all just human, you are giving fear permission to be active in your life because fear is attached to our humanity. I don't know a human being who is human, who is free from fear 100% without some of the solutions that we are going to talk about. Number two. Fear is a reaction to a perceived threat. Verse 15. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. But they weren't dead. They weren't dying. For most of them, there was no probability or possibility that in the immediate future they were going to die. But their fear of death, their fear of what might happen, held them in bondage. We have fear as a reaction to a perceived threat. We have a perception of how things are going to be, what they will mean to us, and whether we have the ability to escape them. But that is a perception, but fear thrives on perceived threats. Okay? Fear thrives on perceived threats. What we think may have happened or what we think might happen, fear thrives in that environment. Number three. Fear has no power to destroy you, only to enslave you. Since the children are flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery or bondage through fear of death. So fear has no power to destroy you, it will just enslave you, which in many ways is worse than being destroyed. Because it means that you are committed to a life imprisonment, not an end to anything. Number four, fear makes us hide. Genesis 3 verse 10. Okay, First mention of fear in the Bible. I was afraid because I was naked. A perception of how things would be, a belief developing. So I hid. Fear will make you not be honest. It'll make you not be honest with yourself. It'll make you not be honest about life. Fear makes us hide. Do you know the thing it makes us hide from the most? The truth. Fear makes us hide from the truth. I was afraid because I was naked. The truth was you are naked. You've recognized you are naked because of what you did. 
You're now believing what you believe because of your recognition that you are naked because you did what you did, but you're not prepared to face the truth because your solution was, so I hid. One of the greatest ways to challenge fear is to live in truth. Because when you know the truth, it will make you free. But when we are afraid, the last thing we want to do is be truthful about the thing that is making us afraid. We just use ways to step away from that fear rather than overcoming that fear that holds us in slavery. Number five, fear always justifies itself and convinces us of its right to exist Therefore, making us afraid to let go of our fears. Let me say that again, because this is very important. Fear always justifies itself and convinces us of its right to exist, therefore making us afraid to let go of our fears. Right? Coming back, Genesis 3 verse 10. I was afraid because. There's the problem right there. Because. I only did that because, I only think that because, I only acted that way because, I only believed that because, there's the problem right there. The problem hinges on this word because and why that's so important is because fear will always justify itself and convince us of its right to exist which means we won't let go of the fear because we always have a because. I'm afraid to go out because. And therefore, leave me alone. Stop bugging me. Leave me here. There's no solution. I live in the house of fear. Stay outside. Knock if you want to come in, but I'm not sure I'm going to let you enter. Fear is the result of believing I will experience an undesirable outcome that I am unsafe in an unsafe world, that nobody has my best interests at heart, and that if I don't make it in my own strength, I will not make it. That's the result of what fear believes. So where is God? Can he help me? The opposite to living in fear is not living in faith. I'm going to talk to you when I talk about faith, that the opposite to faith is not unbelief and doubt. The opposite to faith is sight. We live by faith, not by sight. If you start seeing things right, you'll start believing things right. But when we start to see things wrong, we believe things wrong. And in the same way, the opposite to living in fear is not living in faith. Or if only just had faith that this would be okay. If only I had faith to believe that I could get out of the house of fear. You are barking up the wrong tree, going down the wrong alley, shooting at the wrong target. The opposite to living in fear is not living in faith. The opposite to living in fear is living in love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. So when I am afraid, it doesn't say something went wrong with my faith. It says something's gone wrong with my love. If we can make it about faith, we kind of excuse ourselves to be kind of okay because we're kind of spiritual and it's just the battle of having more faith. But you see, dealing with fear has got nothing to do with how much or how little faith you have. Dealing with fear is a love issue. And if you don't fix the love issue, you won't fix the faith issue. But if you fix the love issue, you'll fix the fear issue. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Either punishment on us, punishment on others, being punished by God, being punished because the situation is not appropriate, life punishing me. Fear is to do with punishment. When we are afraid, we believe we are being punished, have been punished, or are going to be punished in some way. Even if that's just by life, you may say, oh, I don't believe God's punishing me, but you will look at life and say, I'm being punished by that situation, I'm being punished by those words, I'm being punished by this difficulty, But fear has to do with punishment. That's where the fear finds its root. But the one who fears 
is not made perfect in love. So let's be clear when we're talking here about no fear in love and God is love. We're actually not talking about, about the perfection of your love for anybody or for God. We are talking about the perfection of God's love for you and for everybody. That's where the root of perfect love is measured. And that perfect love drives out fear. This love is not something you do. This love is something you receive. But when you receive this love, it becomes something you do. Because then all the things that we said empower fear begin to empower a life of love. And so I begin to believe what love believes. I begin to confess what love confesses. I begin to react to the circumstances of life how love would react to the circumstances of life. What we have to move nearer to is the love that holds us rather than the fear that imprisons us. I'm going to say something very strange. Often we love our fears more than we want to accept the love. Because when we let go our fears, we have to let go all the things that we have anchored our fears into, which might mean what we think about people, what we think about stuff, what we think about God, what we think about life, what we think about relationships. We have to let go of all those things when we move nearer to love. We have to move nearer to the love that holds us than the fear that imprisons us. We've got to move from the house of fear... Refuse to pay the ridiculous mortgage of measureless anxiety and move into the house of God's love. A safe house where we live secure, not in the knowledge that we are enough, but in the knowledge that he is enough. Where there is grace that covers all my sin, strength that covers all my weaknesses, and joy that exceeds all my pain. It's time... To move house. Just bow your heads for one moment. I'd like you, me, all of us to be free from fear, but some would like the easy route to say, well, because it says spirit of fear, it's got to be cast out, which what you're doing again is putting the responsibility on somebody else rather than saying, I have to move house into the house of good love, into the house of God's love. You know, they say that one of the most stressful things in life is moving house. Marriage, something else, I don't know if it's kids or what. Death, death, death's pretty stressful. Although not if you're dying, not if you're the one that's dead. But moving house, moving house is one of the most stressful experiences they say that we can experience in life. It's just as stressful Moving from the house of fear, which is a place with which we become familiar and it's become home to so many of us. But we can make a choice, we're going to move to the house of love. And let me make a suggestion, leave your furniture behind. Leave everything that's associated and attached to those fears, leave it behind and make a decision, I'm moving into the house of love, which might look pretty empty at first, but boy, once you feel that atmosphere and feel that place, you will begin to decorate it with confession and belief and understanding that will make that the house that you live, for there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love, but God is calling us to come to that perfect place where we sit and live in his love. And so, I want to offer a prayer, if you'd like it. I'm going to be very bold tonight, because I think, you know, moving house, you don't do in your head. Moving house, you do because you move. Uh, and to some degree, your house is where it's all going on. So, if you would really, really, really like to be free from and leave the house of fear tonight, I want you to leave your seat. I want you to come and stand here at the front. I want you to be bold enough to actually do that and say, enough is enough. I am, I am moving into the house of love. Because there is no fear in love. No fear in love. The more we go through the threshold, the more we walk into the house, the more we realize that there is no fear because we have moved into the house of love. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. 
And living in that perfect love that is the love that God has given to you and me. It's the love we celebrated yesterday over Jamie. The whole thing with Jamie I expressed yesterday, he had no doubts that God loved him. His struggle was that he didn't love himself. He had no doubts that God had forgiven him, but he couldn't forgive himself. He was living in a house of fear because he couldn't let that perfect love be where he lived. But we're choosing that tonight, aren't we? We're going to choose to make a move. We're going to choose to make a, a shift. Lots of things that frighten all of us. And for all of us, there will be some commonality and then there'll be some really unique little things. It's time to move house. Okay, so getting the removal van ready. And we're going to pray because God is going to be the source of your strength. He's going to be the strength of your life. Okay, the source of your strength and the strength of your life. And so we're going to pray a prayer of freedom. I am not going to endeavor to cast some third-party spirit out of you today because I don't think that's the deal. I think, I think the spirit of fear, as we expressed, was an expression that it's in the heart, it's in the very center of our being, and God didn't put that in us. That got there, but today we're moving house from that. So we're going to pray right now. Father, as these precious people stand here with me today, first of all, confessing that we have lived in the house of fear and are living in the house of fear and that all the furniture and the pictures and the decorations are compounding the problem of our fears. And as we keep seeing those and rehearsing them and revisiting them and talking about them and, 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 and fantasizing around them, deeper and deeper into the bondage of that house of fear. But I declare the doors of the house of fear open today in Jesus' name. I declare the locks broken off the door. I pray that every window blind that has been pulled down so that people cannot see the daylight and the sunshine and the light that is beyond, I pray that those window blinds will lift right now in Jesus' name so that we can see what it is that's outside the house of fear. You said that you would turn our mourning into dancing. You would take the ashes of our struggle and turn them into joy. That you would revolutionize our existence when we live in the house of love. I am believing for that today, Father. So in your name, by your spirit, right now, I pray every door of the house of fear open in Jesus' name. And we step out. And I want to see yourself just in your mind, just in your spirit. See yourself stepping out of where you are, stepping out of that house. See yourself stepping over the threshold, coming out. See it, imagine it. Say, well, isn't that a strange thing to do? How many of you know God imagined the world before he made it? He saw it before it happened. And when he saw it, that's what he began to confess. And we are not going to confess anymore the fears that are binding us, okay? We're going to step out of the house of fear, okay? But what we're going to do right now is just step into the house of love. Step into the Father's arms. Step into the place where there is no fear, where that perfect love drives out fear, where our past cannot follow us, where the things we're struggling with cannot exist. In the place of love, there is no room and no space for them. They're not allowed in the house, and this is what God's house is really all about. We're coming into the place where he exists, where he dwells, the very space that he occupies, that space of love. And so right now, Father, by faith, we step into the house of love. We, 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 we do more than just peek in the windows, which I think we, we've done, or look through the letterbox and kind of just, just have a little gander in when the doors open but tonight, Father, by faith, we step wholly and fully into the house of love. We move in with you into the place of love. And I pray now for the dynamic of the Spirit to work in our lives so that as we step into that love where there is no fear in love, that we will have a wonderful sense of a freedom from the fears that have bound us, a breaking of the bonds, a snapping of the chains, a changing of the mind, a revolutionizing of the thoughts, the mind being in us which was in Christ Jesus. 
the mind that exalts us rather than crushes us because we've found ourselves in you. Lord, by your spirit today, I speak freedom over every heart and over every life that is represented here. I pray for everyone that's struggling. How do I let this go that they will understand that you understand better than they understand and that we're trying to hold on to things because we think I have to understand how I fix this rather than I just have to have the sense to let it go and realize that God is with me and Jesus is with me and the Holy Spirit is with me and what I can't figure out, it will come to me. It will be shown to me. I'll get it. A revelation will come into my spirit. The light will dawn. So I pray for everyone here in the words of Isaiah, arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen on you. Gross darkness may cover the earth and great darkness the people, but the Lord has risen upon you. And so to you a child is born, to you a son is given. And there's a new government taking place on his shoulders. And it's wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I pray over you and into you that of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end to order it from this day forward, Isaiah said, and forevermore in your life. I declare us free in Jesus' name, the source of our strength. The strength of our life, I lift my hands in total praise to you. I want us just to sing that last part of that song, Danny, if we can. I'm bothered about the first bit, but I think this is a declaration that we need to make. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. I lift my hands in total praise to you. Come on, stand with me. of liturgical thought did not allow for us to give the appropriate response other than just the verbal response that was written down on paper and so the forefathers of those that helped me understand some of the things that I understood about God and about the gospel uh, they were very expressive and one of the things that they were known for is the raising of their hands the reason that they did that is because it's the international sign of surrender. It's the international sign that I mean you no harm, I am actually offering myself to you with no violent reaction and no resistance. I put my hands up, you put your hands up. It's the international sign of surrender. So my forefathers who taught me all this were saying, we need to have that because in terms of God and his promises and the goodness of God and the freedoms we're offered, sometimes we just need to surrender. And we need to use the language that speaks to us and speaks to God. And it's the language of the arms that are raised. It's arms of surrender that say, I surrender to you, I surrender to this truth, I surrender to this love. So when we sing things like, I lift my hands in total praise to you, um, it only really works if you lift your hands in total praise to God. Otherwise, it's just words. And it's just religious words that really don't mean anything because it's like, oh... I lift my hands. So, you don't have to do this. We're not that kind of house. But I want to help some of you, particularly those of you who stood at the front here today, that for many of you to surrender would really, really help you. And, and sometimes it's embarrassing. Well, I lift, 
you know, it's like suddenly you think you're the only one here and everybody's looking at you. Well, you are that important to God, but you're not that important to everybody else. So, you know, get that out of your head. Nobody's looking at you thinking, oh, you know, it's the, it's the fear, it's the house of fear that we believe and then we confess, or oh, what people are going to think this if I do this. And we're on the conveyor belt of fear and then we interpret it a certain way. But I believe it would help some of you today if you sung these words with your arms raised because you're saying, God, regardless of anybody else in this building, I mean business today and I want that spirit of fear to be broken in my heart. And so... I'm declaring you the source of my strength and the strength of my life. And to show that I surrender to that truth, I lift my hands in total praise to you. Is that right? So that's what I want you to do if you want to do it. All right, you are the source. You are the source.
Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.